Marinades. Am I recording? Oh yeah, I'm definitely recording. Okay. I want you to take a minute and imagine this, all right? Imagine it's October and you're still in elementary school. You're just a disgusting, greasy little child. The, ha <laughs> the hallways are decorated with paper jack-o'-lanterns. Disney Channel is showing the first two Harry Potter movies that night. And all you can think about is what you're gonna be for Halloween. Probably just, uh, it's gonna be Indiana Jones again. Your class is scheduled for library time this week, so naturally, in the spirit of the season, you want to get a spooky book to read during independent reading time. The thing is, you've read all the Goosebumps books, and Curse of the Campfire Weenies and Banicula really don't provide that cutting-edge thrill that eight-year-old you craves anymore. You want something scary. Suddenly, your eyes catch notice of something different. You see a book with this on the cover. The book that you found is part of a trilogy known as the Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, and is the source of almost all my childhood dramas. Written by Alvin Schwartz, the Scary Stories series was a collection of short stories based around folklore and urban legends, with much of the content being somewhat frightening to a degree. In concept, these books don't sound too different from the Goosebumps books written by R.L. Stein. What was different was the content of the stories. You see, Stein's stories never contain death, and he's gone on record saying that the books have been successful because they don't contain, and I quote, drugs, depravity, or violence. <laughs> While I'm pretty sure they didn't have any drugs, the scary stories had pretty much all the rest of that stuff. Uh, characters were frequently placed in situations that posed serious threats to their lives and often died rather explicitly. Like in one of the most famous stories, Harold, where a scarecrow genuinely comes to life climbs onto the roof of a house and skins a farmer alive. Now tell me, which scarecrow is gonna scare you more? The one from Goosebumps that Grand Theft Auto's a combine towards a house full of Midwestern Americans at the speed of a Walmart mobility scooter? Or the one that genuinely skins a man alive like Arthur Morgan with a deer? If you're anything like me, the answer is both. Both of these made me very, very afraid of farms. But obviously the scarier of the two is the one where the guy gets his flesh removed. Uh, the books also had, like, no problem with animal deaths for whatever reason. Uh, like in the story Me Tai Doty Walker, where a boy and his dog are offered a thousand dollars to spend a night inside a haunted mansion. A great deal, in my opinion. Around halfway through the night, they start hearing a voice from the woods chanting, Me Tai Doty Walker. But then, as all dogs do, the dog responds back by saying, Lynchy Kinchy Molly Collie Dingo Dingo. And then some other stuff happens that I don't remember, and then a severed head falls down the chimney, and the dog sees it and immediately dies of fright. That's it. That's literally the entire story. The dog starts speaking infernal and then drops dead because he doesn't like heads. Also, the head screams or something. I, I really don't remember this one. I think it's also worth mentioning that the art by Stephen Gamble was uh, absolutely horrifying. The charcoal and ink drawings made use of strong shadows and light so that only some of the gruesome details were shown, leaving the rest up to your little kitty imagination. Gamble also draws many of the pictures facing directly towards the reader, giving off the unnerving feeling that they're looking right at you. Even some of the art for the joke stories were nightmare inducing. What was funny about this one, Steven? How is this supposed to make me laugh? The art also included this like trademark technique of including these weird hair or vein-like attachments that hung down from every drawing, making them seem ancient and, and unnatural. Now, after hearing these stories and seeing the pictures, you might be thinking, well, Jesus Christ, these don't sound like children's books. And that's where you're wrong, idiot, because Wikipedia clearly lists them as children's literature and also as horror. Just like Wikipedia, a lot of people didn't know exactly where to place these books. The language used in them made it seem like they were targeted at maybe 3rd or 4th grade readers, but the content made it seem like they were clearly meant for 5th or 7th grade readers. Because of this confusion, they managed to find their way into elementary school libraries all across America after the release in 1981. Shockingly enough to some, the books were actually really popular among children, despite their material. Soon kids were pissing themselves at night and sharing scary stories beneath the slide at recess nationwide. Sadly though, some of these children were weak-willed cowards who cried to their parents about how the big, bad, scary book they got from the library made them cry. Most parents did the reasonable thing and told their kids to just not read the book, but some PTA warriors decided that that wasn't enough. They climbed into their trusty 1975 country squires to take things up with the most powerful person they knew, the school principal. 
To sum things up, some parents got really heated about the books and how they gave their kids nightmares, so they eventually brought it all the way up to the school district superintendent to try and get the books banned entirely from elementary school libraries. All Alvin Schwartz had to say about this was that he was glad the books were getting attention, which honestly I find really funny. The books were named one of the most challenged books of the 1990s and the 2000s, and again in 2012. These books remain controversial to this day, and to some degree, I really should be thankful that I got the chance to read these books at all. Not just because there's the possibility that I never would have been able to read these otherwise, but, but also because I feel like these books had a real impact on me. I'm not going to come out here and act like these books helped me explore difficult subjects like mortality or death, because they didn't. They just made me really scared that scarecrow men lived behind my house. But that doesn't mean that they weren't important to me. Up until this point, the only books that I'd been introduced to were either Jan Brett or Junie B. Jones, which, by the way, shout out to Mama Brett for drawing some of the coziest pictures of all time. These books were fine in their own right, but they always left me feeling like they were made for children. Scary stories to tell in the dark, on the other hand, didn't pander to me or treat me like a child, which I really appreciated. Yeah, they might have been a little traumatizing, as the number one mommy's boy Sigmund Freud might have said, but I think that might have been a good thing. See, these books felt like they weren't meant for children, like you were getting your hands on something that you were never really meant to see. I was definitely not allowed to be reading books where a man watches an elevator full of people fall multiple stories to their demise. Because I wasn't supposed to be even reading something like this, when I got scared, I wasn't able to crawl into bed with mommy and daddy because then they would know something was up. So then I would have to lay in bed and hide under the covers until morning eventually came, safe and sound. Do I make it? These books, whether intended or not, forced me to face my fears by myself, and I think that's a pretty good thing. They also fueled my obsession with ghosts, leading me to sneak downstairs to my parents' iMac G4 to look up evidence of ghosts on YouTube. So to some degree, these books kind of domino-affected their way into introducing me to YouTube. So I think that's pretty cool too.